Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Last, last Sunday we talked about that Jesus was a risen Savior, right? We celebrate that Jesus is a risen Savior, amen? Well, we believe in a risen Savior. But how do we really know? Is there proof that we can state? Is there evidence that we can share with unbelievers so that they can search and find out for themselves if there truly is a risen Savior? And the answer is absolutely yes, there is proof, amen? King David prophesied Jesus' resurrection. I already alluded to it in our, in our, our bulletin. It says, Psalm 16.10, a Mitch Tam of David, for you will not leave my soul among the dead. David knew he wasn't going to remain dead in the grave. He knew he was going to be in eternity with the Lord God. He knew that God was going to raise him from the dead. And then he went on to, to say and prophesied that that the Messiah, the Holy One, was not going to rot in the grave. Instead, he was going to be risen from the dead. He knew it. He prophesied it. Amen? Isn't that amazing that King David knew that? King David knew that. It, it goes on to say, now, a mictum of, of, of King David, it means it's a psalm as precious as stamped gold. So you can trust God's word. It's as precious as stamped gold. Amen? Now, we go on, and, and, and this is in the book of Acts. Paul refers to the same thing that David just, uh, that we just saw in, in Psalm 16, 10. Paul says, another psalm, speaking about Psalm 16, 10, explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. This is not a reference to David, for David had done the will of God in his own generation. But he died and was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. No, it was a reference to someone else, someone whom God raised, and whose body did not decay. Amen? So, we understand that, 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 that God prophesied all of this beforehand, and his prophets of old knew about this. Later on, we're going to see that Peter affirmed the same thing. So we have David, Paul, and, and soon we're going to look at Peter uh, as he preaches. Uh, many Now, listen, brothers and sisters, many people saw Jesus dead. Then three days later, they saw the tomb empty, and then Jesus was alive again. Now, here's the question. But how can we know it's true that the apostles actually saw Jesus risen from the dead? We just have to take their word for it? Yes and no. Uh, we can trust the testimony of the apostles and the early leaders and followers of the Christian church because of what they did after Jesus ascended into heaven. Now listen, listen carefully. Most of the followers at Jesus' crucifixion abandoned him at his most darkest hour. They, they, his followers abandoned him. Peter denied Jesus three times. The apostles and early believers were all afraid of the Jewish leaders of the synagogue and the Roman authorities. They were in fear. They were hiding in a locked room until Jesus came to see them in his risen body. Amen? Now listen, the early believers were in a panic and without hope. They had no hope. They lost their Savior. He's dead. Until they saw a risen Jesus. Then they became filled with great power from God because they saw a risen Christ. Amen? If they had not seen, yes, a hand clap of praise. Now listen, if they had not seen a risen Christ, they still would have been afraid, scared, and would have most likely abandoned their faith in Christ. But since they saw a risen Savior, they realized 
Nothing could stop their Savior, amen? Not even death. They had undeniable proof that there is a God and that God revealed himself in human form to defeat all human sin and death. Amen? Amen? Now, this victory over death is proof that is totally undeniable. Now remember, they are, they are therefore preaching about a living God. Now listen, one minute the apostles and the leaders of the church were afraid beyond their control. The next, the next moment, they were filled with enormous courage and conviction when the Holy Spirit came upon them in the upper room and gave them a new birth and power from on high. Amen? This new birth of the Holy Spirit occurred on the day of Pentecost, which was celebrated 50 days after the Passover and was called the Feast of the First Fruits. It is not coincidental that the Holy Spirit began the Church of Jesus on the day of First Fruits, because the fruit of the Spirit are the first fruits for the new believer. Amen? Is there rejoicing in the house today? So we, so we see, brothers and sisters, we had apostles and leaders shaking in their boots until they saw a risen Savior. When they saw the risen Savior, we're going to see that they had a huge transformation from great fear to great courage by the apostles and leaders of this newly formed church because of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? They were afraid one minute. But when they saw a risen Savior, they became emboldened and said, nothing can stop us now. And guess what? Nothing did because over 1950 years later, here we are worshiping and praising the same God, the same risen Savior. Amen? Amen. So let's look at, at, at this transformation in, in the book of Acts chapter 2. This is Peter. He's preaching on the day of Pentecost. So on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. All the uh, alarms went off like there was a, 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 a tornado. Okay, All the alarms went off. Everybody was gathered around. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. On the next screen it says, At the time there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. They were there to celebrate the day of Pentecost. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed, these people are all from Galilee. They don't know how to speak our language. How, do we, how is it that we're hearing the good news about God in our own language? It goes on to say, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear the, these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Is there a shout out of praise? Amen? Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit birthed the first church in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit gave the apostles the ability to preach uh, in Galilee, and yet the listeners heard Peter preach in their native tongues. This is a miracle. The apostles and leaders didn't have the education nor the time to learn all these languages, so the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to preach in other native languages. These Jewish worshipers, again, came from Turkey, Iran, Persia, Greece, Rome, Arabia, Egypt, Libya, and they all heard Peter preaching in their native language. 
This was not Babel or a foreign language that no one could understand. Everyone, everyone understood what was being said. The speaking in tongues that we hear nowadays is a counterfeit tongues that is not biblical. It is Satan's counterfeit because he always tries to copy what God does to confuse people with a false copy. So, let us read on. It goes on to say, uh, They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can all this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed and mocked them and said, saying, Oh, they're all just drunk. Then Peter stepped forward with 11 other apostles. They were not afraid anymore. All 11 of them were there. They were not afraid anymore. And they shouted to the crowd. They didn't, Jesus is alive. They shouted, Jesus is alive. Amen. They shouted to the crowd and said, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. It goes on to say, these people are not drunk as some of you are assuming. It's nine o'clock in the morning. It's much too early for that. He goes on to say, no, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit upon all people and your sons and daughters, they will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. He goes on to say, in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below and blood and fire and clouds of smoke. He goes on to say, the sun will become dark, the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus. But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders and signs through him. As you all well know, you saw him. He said, he's calling him out. He said, you saw him. You saw them. He goes on to say, but God knew what would happen. Let me back up a little bit. So some people in the crowd, they began to invalidate the truth by saying these guys were drunk. Peter said, we are not drunk because people were seeing and hearing a miracle. Then Peter began to explain the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets like Joel, Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, that God was in the last days going to pour out a spirit on believers and that they would prophesy magnificent things of God to the people through and about the risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Amen? Peter further prophesied that even more signs and wonders will take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us read further. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David, amen? amen. Shout out of praise, amen. King David said, said this about him. He said, I see that the Lord is always with me. Is that truth? Amen. Amen. He's with you. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad. My tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. So we hear Peter preaching the same thing that David and Paul did. Amen? Amen. He says, you have shown me the way of life. You will fill me with the joy of your presence. Is there anybody lacking joy? Get in God's presence. That's where the fullness of joy is. Amen? He goes, he goes on to say, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died, was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. 
But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants, human descendants, would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. Amen? He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead, nor allow his body to rot into the grave. Isn't that amazing? Peter told the Jews that God knew what they were going to do with Jesus and that they would crucify him. In knowing what they would do to his son, God used their evil to let them crucify an innocent man, his son, so that God could defeat sin and death and bring ultimate victory to his people. To who would believe what God did and was doing and he, what he was doing was loving mankind and saving them from their ugly sin and rebellion. Amen? Is there a shout out of praise in the house of God today? Amen? Is there rejoicing? So Peter quoted King David from Psalm 1610 because King David knew that God was going to place the Messiah on the throne that was from King David's human lineage, which was through Mary and Joseph and Jesus. So, so Jesus had a earthly mother, but the God Jesus had a heavenly father. He was both God and man. Amen? So God raised Jesus bodily from, the, from death to prove he is God and to demonstrate he has power over sin, death, and everything. Is the rejoicing in the house of God today? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is this is the foundation of what we all believe. The risen Savior. Mankind's evil demented schemes will not defeat God. Jehovah God laughs at the evil schemes of man and of Satan. Amen. Let us read further in uh, Acts chapter two thirty two. He says, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now, he is exalted to the places, place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And, that, and the Father, as he promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out on us. Amen? Just as you see in here today. He says, what you're seeing and hearing today is the whole evidence of the Holy Spirit of God coming upon them because this is the first day of the church. Amen? For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said this. The Lord said to my Lord, he's speaking, David's speaking to God, and he said, the Lord said to my Lord, to, speaking to God and, and talking about Jesus, sit in the place of honor at my right hand, that's Jesus, until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Amen? Did Peter sound afraid? He did not sound afraid, did he? He was not worried what they were going to do to him. Because he knew he was doing what God wanted him to do. Amen? And we need not be afraid either. We need to proclaim the mighty name of Jesus. We do not need to fear what people or man are going to do to us. Because we are serving the risen Savior. Amen? He goes on to say, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do to be saved? Peter replied, each one of you must repent uh, and of your sins and turn to God and be baptized. Be immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, even all the way to Emmanuel Church, to you. Amen? Amen. Is there a hallelujah in the house? <laughs> Then Peter, Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all of his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And all generations are crooked. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized in Christ and in water, 
and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Amen? 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 So, brothers and sisters, to those of us who have been born again, we now have the same testimony as the apostles. We have the same testimony. <clears throat> they physically saw Jesus risen from the dead, and they also received the Holy Spirit that is now dwelling in them. Uh, there was no fear in the apostles anymore because the love of Christ through the Comforter cast out all fear and gave them power, love, and a strong, calm mind. God gave the apostles and leaders his courageous spirit. Amen? And we have that same spirit living and dwelling in us. Um, hopefully we don't quench and grieve it. Again, Jehovah God has given us the same spirit, a spirit of courage and boldness. That is, if we don't grieve or quench it. Amen? God himself is risen in us and has given us a brand new powerful life. We didn't see Jesus physically while he was here on earth, but we see him spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Amen? So, brothers and sisters, we are the proof of the risen Savior because when we believe God, he kept his promise for over 1,950 years that we will also prophesy the name of Jesus as Lord and Messiah. So say it with me. Jesus is Lord and Messiah. Jesus. Lord and Messiah. Let's say it a little bit louder. Jesus, Jesus is Lord and Messiah. And Messiah. One more time. Jesus. Jesus is Lord and Messiah. Now take that message out there. Amen? Amen? To wrap this all up, we're going to go to Ephesians now. Ephesians 3 says, and this is Paul speaking now. Before it was Peter, this is Paul. He says, when I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. Uh, most of us are Gentiles, right? Assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. He goes on to say, God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles, prophets, and to us. And this is God's plan. Here it is. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. We're the same. Both are part of the body. That's why they call our faith the Judeo-Christian faith. Because we're combined together in the blood of Christ. The Messiah's blood. And we both enjoy the promise of blessing, blessings because we belong to Christ Jesus. Amen? He goes on to say, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we've gone over it. We have endless treasures in Jesus Christ. We need not fear anything or anyone. God will never leave us or forsake us. Amen? No matter if they take everything we have, even our life, it is guaranteed by the power of God. Amen? Um, the, the treasures are endless. Paul goes on to say, I was chosen to explain this to everyone, this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. And then he finishes up in the next. God's purpose, here it is. Here's the conclusion of this whole message. God's purpose in all this was to use who? The church. The church. Who's the church? Us. us. He, God's purpose in all this was to use us to display his wisdom. Brothers and sisters, you have a wisdom that is far beyond anything on this earth. Uh, your, your wisdom is higher than any PhD, XYZ, 
anything. Okay? God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to who? To all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Have you ever read that before? We are here to display the wisdom of God to all the angels of heaven and all the angels of hell as well as to all the people here on earth. We are the wisdom of God. Amen? Amen. We are the proof of a risen Savior. We, we are to demonstrate the wisdom of God in our daily living, in thought, word, and deed to all the world, to, to the human world, to, and to the unseen world. We are the wisdom of God. Amen? It's a huge, huge responsibility that we cannot deliver unless we're submitted to the power and strength of the Holy Spirit of God that lives and dwells in us. Amen? Is there a shout out of praise? You are special. You are extraordinary because we serve an extraordinary God. So then he says, this was the, his eternal plan. He planned it that way to use the common, uh, less noble, the base people of the world to confound the wise and to bring nothing those that think that they're something. You and me. Amen. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, here it is, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Brothers and sisters, you've got it all. You have got it all. Amen? So as believers, we have many proofs by which we engage our faith in the principle of God's word. We have example after example. When we applied God's word about salvation and accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, he saved us from our sins and we became born again. God's word is true. It is evidence. We have many examples. When we, when we, the, the, the truth of sowing what you reap, if you sow blessing and love, and peace, you're going to reap blessing and love and peace. It's God's word. When we engage in principles of, like Pastor Ray was talking about, tithing, God begins to pour out blessings on us that we won't have room enough to receive. When we, when we lend to the poor, God says, I will, re I will repay you for your offerings to the poor. Um, we think that we have to carve out a living in so that we can survive on this earth. We get it backwards. God says, seek me first in my kingdom, and I'll give you all you need, not only to, not only to survive, but to thrive. Amen. Amen? God didn't want us to be paupers. He wanted us to thrive. That doesn't mean that we're all going to be rich. It means we're all going to be rich in blessings and things that really, really count. Amen? The, the, the examples go on and on and on. Now, all, all, the proof is, is, almost, is almost endless. Now, everyone wants to be a part of the American dream. The American dream that seems to be disappearing, right? It is, it is a great dream. But listen, brothers and sisters, it's a second-rate dream. The American dream is to make it big and have an impact in our lifetime on the world. Everyone wants to leave a legacy behind. Almost all the immigrants that come to this country want to have a better life that America has to offer. However great these desires are to accomplish goodness and greatness, they're still second best. Jehovah God never intended for just a few to reach the American type dream. Jehovah God wants everyone to reach far beyond the American dream to the heavenly dream. The dream of total and absolute victory over and above any other worldly dream. The greatest, and here it is, the greatest and most powerful fulfillment of a dream is to have the heavenly dream, which is to spend eternity with the greatest being of all, 
the Lord God himself. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us tell everyone about the greatest dream they can have in Jesus as their God, as their Savior, as their friend who loved them to death because Jesus is a risen Savior. Amen? Can we pray?